This week on The Communicators, a roundtable discussion on broadcast frequencies and their potential use for the expansion of broadband in the United States. Our guests are Michael Calabrese and David Donovan, two members of a Commerce Department Advisory Committee on the matter of spectrum use. Well, our goal this week on The Communicators is twofold. Number one, to learn what the spectrum is. And if you've been following telecommunications at all, particularly in the last couple of months, you've heard a lot about the spectrum. So that's our first goal. Our second goal, then, is to hear some different viewpoints on how the spectrum can be best managed. And we have two guests to introduce to you this week. Both are members of the Commerce Department Spectrum Advisory Committee. First off, David Donovan, and secondly, Michael Calabrese. Mr. Calabrese, what is a spectrum? Well, what we, uh, much more commonly known as the public airwaves, it's really not a tangible thing at all, but the electromagnetic properties of the Earth's atmosphere which allow the transmission of radio waves. And we call it the spectrum because it's a spectrum of frequencies that can carry, you know, different, basically different waves with different propagation characteristics. So some are high frequency waves that carry uh, a lot of information, but, but, but not through walls or trees or over very long distances. And then there are low frequency uh, uh, bands, such as those used by television which are considered the beachfront, the very best, because those frequencies carry radio signals you know, you know, through multiple walls, through trees, and in rural areas over very long distances. So it's a set of frequencies that are useful for communicating, and it's all owned by the American people as a kind of a public resource. David Donovan, anything to that uh, definition that you would like to no, add? No, I, I think I think that's essentially correct. I mean, since you know, the age of Marconi, and actually, it, it started with the sinking of the Titanic, of all all things. Wireless communications have been important in this country, and through the Department of Commerce, and and certainly since the 1920s, through the Federal Radio Commission and the Federal Communications Commission, you have the government, uh, a government entity that has been established to examine uses and to set up a licensing structure which will allow certain businesses to use certain parts of the spectrum for certain things. Federal government use and military use, of course, is still controlled uh, through the FET by the, the uh, Department of Commerce and the uh, Independent Radio Advisory Committee. But the commercial side of the business, be it television, be it radio, be it cellular telephones, is regulated through the Federal Communications Commission. When was the spectrum discovered? Uh, the spectrum was discovered, frankly, when the first person opened their mouth and, and uttered the spoken word. It is the ability to transmit and send information over a frequency in which can be heard by the human ear. Um, as you move higher up in frequencies, we, of course, as human beings, may not be able to hear them, but you can develop devices that are capable of listening and hearing and transmitting it back into sound waves and in, in, in frequencies which we can hear. So it, it, it has been there and it has been commercially looked at probably since around the turn of the century. Michael Calabrese, is the spectrum finite? Uh, well, it's, it, it, that's an interesting question because, I mean, it is finite in terms of the number of frequencies because when you get beyond the radio spectrum, in other words, when you get into, you know, ultra high frequency, you're starting to get into other, other types of, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, electronic uh, airwaves, such as uh, X-rays and, and gamma waves and, and light, invisible light. That's all part of the same spectrum. So what we're talking about is a very tiny part of the spectrum that's useful for uh, radio uh, communication that can carry digital bits. And we're talking about sound and radio here, but this also, the spectrum also carries pictures. Correct. I.e. TV. Absolutely. All spectrum, everything on the spectrum is wireless, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, we found this crazy quilt online, and this mm -hmm. is put out by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration of the Commerce Department. And this is kind of a visual map of what the spectrum is. Now, this large section here is devoted to AM radio, mm -hmm. uh, and these sections here that you see, these blue ones, are all broadcast TV. They seem mm -hmm. to have a lot of the spectrum. Is that correct? Well, they do, although I, I think, as I said, that, that chart is logarithmic, so it actually overstates 
in, in terms of a picture, what the actual amount is. For example, in the beachfront spectrum that, that Michael has referred to. And why do uh, they, again, why do they call it beachfront? Well, that is the area of spectrum, and it's, it's actually a debate about that, um, in which you're using spectrum which has fairly good propagation characteristics to carry signals over fairly long distances. Um, actually, the best area for carrying signals over long distances is your AM band. So lower you go, the longer the signal can get out there. For video, um, television occurs in both. You'll see two segments here. One is VHF and one is UHF. And in fact, it's in the 70s with the development of UHF reception capability that that band really blossomed in its ability to be used for, for video pictures. I guess the one thing about that chart that is somewhat deceiving only because of the way it's laid out is of that area, the 225 to 3.7 gigahertz, the so-called beachfront that everyone ta has been talking about in Washington. And where well, is that on this chart? It's, uh, it Go ahead starts, and point to it well, if you will. I'm trying to, like most things, I need glasses right. to see this. It essentially starts a little bit below channel 14 and moves up. It starts somewhere around here and moves further up the band up to here. Okay. The, uh, the thing is that television broadcasting actually of that beachfront only has exclusive use of roughly 5.1% of the spectrum. Now, in major markets, we share spectrum, and you can see that on that chart, channels 14 to 20, with police departments and land mobile operations. So all in all, we use about 8%, which means about 91% of that so-called beachfront spectrum is actually used by some other entity. How is it licensed? How is spectrum licensed? Uh, well, yeah, that, that's an important point because w one thing this chart uh, indicates is that everything is spoken for. So when you look at all of these bands of frequencies, there's, uh, you know, as you said, a crazy quilt of, uh, of, of different uh, allocations. And these are just allocations. Right. Behind this are tens of thousands of licenses. And uh, the, the way that works is that a whole lot of the spectrum, in fact, far more than the broadcasters used, is reserved by the federal government for its own operations. What, so, what, what percentage of the spectrum is reserved by the government? Well, again, what's, you know, the thing about spectrum is it's like real estate, location, location, location. So the federal government uh, has, I think, roughly 40% of the so-called beachfront of the uh, of the spectrum that's selling for billions of dollars at auctions. And they're using very little of that at, at any particular place or time. Uh, the military is by far the largest holder of, of spectrum. Uh, you know, th they want to have it in case they need it, you know, for certain uh, and where missions. where on this chart would the military spectrum lie? Well, th they throughout? are... Throughout? Yeah, I mean, th throughout. Th th throughout, And yeah. how would it be labeled? on this chart. It may not even be labeled or it may be labeled as government use. Okay, yeah. they have there government are, use, they've there got are re fixed. They have fixed, they have mobile, they have radar capabilities. Okay. Um, and, in, and in fact, uh, to Michael's point, I think one of the things, whether you, you started with the spectrum is finite or not, it is finite to the extent that technology exists. So for example, um, you have in the five gigahertz band, uh, which is way up okay. at the far end of that chart. If we could stop, what right. is a gigahertz, what is a megahertz, and right. is it a, a KHC, what, is that, what does that stand for? Kilohertz. Kilohertz, okay. Uh, essentially what you're looking at is, is a description as to how many, think of frequencies as channels, almost like a checkerboard, and, or, as a, or as a ruler. And as you start down low, you're at the lower end of the band. And as you move further up in the kilohertz, you're down on kilohertz, and then you go up to, and then you go up to your megahertz, and then you go up to gigahertz. And the further up you go, as, as Michael indicated, the shorter the the you almost need not line of sight to use those bands. So, for example, at a higher band, military radar may work quite well. Right. Uh, at 5 gigahertz, for example, there's military radar that's used up there because it's line of sight coming back and forth from planes or what have you flying overhead. But recently, we have been able to, as technology develops, use that part of the band, which is non-beachfront, as it were, for other services. So, for example, you have unlicensed Wi-Fi services that share uh, with, with military radar in the 5 gigahertz band. And so they're up in the gigahertz. They're all over, actually. We can, they're, they're plopped in various locations. Why? Why? 
why are they in various locations? Oh, well, actually, mm -hmm. because you know, different frequencies are useful for different uh, services and activities. So, uh, so for example, for a, a, a mm -hmm. you know a line, a line of sight sort of activity, like uh, such as certain radars uh, or what they would call backhaul, like if you're trying to send a whole bunch of data, almost like wireless fiber, um, y you know, you would want to use a high frequency. Whereas you want to use a low frequency if you're trying to go a very long distance, uh, even though that would take more power, for example. Where right. would an Apple, the Apple company, um, where would the iPod fit on this chart? I mean, in, in the kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, again, all over, and how much space would they be taking on this spectrum? Well, a lot of those frequencies that would, you would be used for wireless broadband, the, the television stations, which occupied from channels 2 to 69, gave up what we call the 7, not gave up, but we reallocated the 700 megahertz band. In effect, for your viewers, that's channels 52 to 69. That band was recently auctioned. Which is right here Correct. on this map, that, right. these blue spaces. Right. That, that spectrum was reallocated and auctioned and is now being used for wireless mobile video services. And essentially, that's sort of the first step. They're roughly about 700, and I think it's 740, 790 megahertz of spectrum, channels of spectrum, that have been allocated for wireless broadband services that have yet to be fully built and are intended to be built out in the next couple of years. How much of this spectrum is unused or unclaimed? Any of it? Um, well, that's very interesting because the conventional wisdom in Washington is really this chart, which looks like, you know, everything is being occupied. And certainly everything has been allocated for a service and assigned with a license to, you know, some party or the other, whether it's, the, whether it's to a federal agency like the military or the commercial spectrum has been, licenses are issued. Uh, you know, for, for, for use. But if you go out with a, um, a, a spectrum analyzer and you actually measure uh, the use of the airwaves, so we did that, for example, from the roof of our building in Washington near the White House, and this is probably the busiest uh, set of airwaves in the country. And there was another study that did it in Manhattan and in many other places. You find that actually even, in, even over the course of a business day in downtown Washington or in Manhattan, uh, that less than 20% of the beachfront spectrum, the very best frequencies, are occupied on any given day in any given place. In the uh, kind of exurban and rural areas, it's single digit. So most of the spectrum is, is unused most of the time, which is why um, get using smart radio technologies to do the sort of spectrum sharing that David mentioned before, such as what the military allows with radar in the five gigahertz band, that is really, you know, where we believe we'll find, you know, the greatest amount of new capacity that will be needed to meet the exploding uh, demand for mobile right. broadband data, like the iPhone. Right. And, and we slightly disagree on this. Actually, we significantly disagree on this. Um, for example, if you go into New York City and you say these are the channels that are being used in the beachfront, for example, and television stations are on 24/7, and we are using all those frequencies. Now, we also share frequencies with three of the television channels that are now used by public safety in New York City. Now, depending on standing on a roof and putting out a monitor, you may not pick up all that public safety use because those radio communications may be relatively short. So it looks vacant, but it isn't. In addition, C-SPAN, CNN, every local news operation are using those channels for wireless microphone communications going and going back and forth in reporting. Depending on where you stand, and I know, for example, in New York City, it was in, I believe it was in the other side of the river, you won't pick up those channels being used. So that's one piece of this. The other piece of this, and I think it's really, really important here, when you start looking at whether it's broadcasting or any other use, when you have equipment that has been sold and the public has been consumed, for example, with television, consumers just bought $109 billion worth of digital equipment. The government subsidized 34 million DTV converter boxes. Now, if I'm tuning to channel 20 
and that's all over the air. That's use all of the over spectrum. the air use of the spectrum. If I turn to channel 20 right now, and suddenly, I have someone using channel 21 in Washington, D.C. Um, I will interfere with someone trying to watch channel 20. So when you talk about spectrum not being used or being used, you can't talk about that in a vacuum. You have to really, it's ultimately a consumer issue, and you have to look at what equipment is out there and how it is functioning and how it is operating. Because the idea of more efficiency has to be examined. Nothing is more efficient if the net result is that the equipment doesn't work because of interference. And I don't want to, we can get very much into the engineering aspects of that, but it is a consideration that's often overlooked in these discussions. And we will. This is the communicators program on C-SPAN. We're talking about the spectrum, the radio spectrum, the broadcast spectrum trying to find out what it is and best ways to manage it. Our guests are David Donovan and Michael Calabrese. Both are members of the Commerce Spectrum Advisory Committee. And uh, Mr. Calabrese is also the uh, uh, director of the Wireless Future Program at the New America Foundation. He's a lawyer. And Mr. Donovan is also a lawyer and president of the Association for Maximum Service Television. So you get an idea of where they're coming from. Gentlemen, uh, recently on this program, FCC Chair Julius Jenikowski was on, as was Marty Cooper, mm -hmm. the founder of the cell phone. Sure. And mm -hmm. both had something to say about the spectrum and efficiency. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to find ways to look at spectrum policy to encourage more efficient use of spectrum. Uh, there are policies like potentially secondary licensing of spectrum, more spectrum flexibility that uh, will, uh, will uh, encourage the private market and lead to more efficient use of spectrum. But the solution to the spectrum problem is not redistributing the spectrum. Uh, it's not taking spectrum away from one entity, not even sharing the spectrum. It is, in fact, creating new capacity in effect creating new spectrum. And that potential, that process has been going on for 110 years and the potential for increasing the amount of spectrum is enormous. Michael Calabrese, spectrum efficiency. Well, you know, Marty Cooper had a very good point, which is why there's something we call Cooper's Law, which is that 95% uh, of the increase in the carrying capacity of the airwaves uh, over the past half century has come actually not from making more airwaves available for use. That's been a very small part of it. The biggest part has been by redu shrinking the cell sizes. In other words, reducing the um, uh, reusing spectrum. But by, so when you see, for example, a cell tower, um, you know, w w we used to think about um, cell phones, and this is still true, particularly in maybe suburban and rural areas, a cell tower covering many square miles. Uh, but increasingly, particularly in the cities, the companies now have to um, make these, these cell, the cell coverage areas much smaller because they're running out of uh, spectrum to use. And so they can reuse the same frequency over and over again by shrinking uh, the, the, the size of, of the area. And, and ultimately, we think, gi given this, uh, this huge projected um, increase in mobile data demand from smartphones and from laptops and the fact that everybody wants to be mobile. What this will mean, you know, we think is that increasingly we're going to have to have smarter radio devices that uh, use uh, Wi-Fi, for example, much of the time. In other words, if, if you're here at C-SPAN or if you're at home or if you're in a public place, you know, your communication should go over uh, shared spectrum into the, the local wireline that's available and only use the expensive license spectrum and the carrier built infrastructure such as the towers when you really need uh, the mobility or you don't have access uh, to, uh, you know, to a local network. We're gonna have to right. use those kind of technologies. Right, and I, and I think we're, our, our position on this is that we have just gone through from an analog to a digital transition. And like Dr. Cooper, internally within the alloc this frequencies that were allocated to broadcasting, um, 108 megahertz of spectrum, or 25% of the spectrum that had previously been allocated to television, was reallocated. We are doing more with less, 
right now. And I think if you look at the architecture and the structure of your local over-the-air broadcaster, this isn't your, 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 your father's or, or your grandfather's broadcasting system. Uh, with digital transmission, we are able to do high-definition television, free, over the air. The second thing is we're able to do multicast services. In fact, since the digital transition, there's over 1,400 new video over-the-air programming streams that have come online. And in addition, we're doing mobile as well. And so if you're looking for high-quality video content, a point to multipoint service, which is what broadcasting is, you have a tower and it's reaching out to millions of viewers, and I might add, extremely important, cable subscribers as well, because most cable, cable systems in this country receive their signal through that primary sig over the year at the cable head end to retransmit it down the wire. But the same thing with cable satellites. Cable users do not use spectrum, is that correct? Is that not, fair? Not quite. Um, they, use, they see it in a number of, of areas. First of all, um, a significant number of cable subscribers have off-air television capability in their homes. Indeed, the GAO said that 35% of Americans' homes rely on off-air television. And that includes cable subscribers for second and third sets, multi-generational homes, things of that nature. But where they also use it, and I'm not so sure they, 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 it, it's readily apparent, is that signal, for the most part, going to the cable head and comes in over the year from the broadcaster. And the same thing with satellite. It has become really important, and we spent about a year working with uh, small cable companies, particularly out in the exurban and, and rural areas, because it, it is almost too costly to, to connect those systems with fiber. And that over-the-air signal, in the reach of that over-the-air signal, is absolutely critical for cable subscribers. And we've worked very well with NCTA and with um, the American Cable Association to make sure that that wasn't disrupted during the transition. Michael Calabrese, what have you seen in the national broadband plan that affects spectrum management, and what do you think of the proposals that have been made? Yeah, the, well, well, there's some uh, some very good good things in there. Um, we, we thought there was uh, well, for one thing, there's there's an emphasis on reallocating spectrum that may be available for auction uh, on an exclusive basis to companies like, you know, the Verizons and the AT&Ts for, you know, devices like the iPhone. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that reflects also in part the government's desire to get some uh, auction revenue. And where on this spectrum map is, is, that, uh, uh, is that real estate? Well, th they're looking again, for it again. This the so so-called beachfront below back in, three point seven gigahertz. Yeah, there and 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 up, right. and and the plan. And when you say up, do you mean uh, well higher up the band? Higher yeah. up in the no, that way. <laughs> this way, this yeah. way. Okay, all right. Okay. So um, right, and uh, in fact, the plan specifically. In fact, one of the most controversial things in the broadband plan is uh, the recommendation that an that an additional. Uh, 20 channels of television be reallocated uh, for for broadband so to, to move from broadcast to broadband. Even though we just we just went through a DTV transition to free up 18 channels, the plan calls for freeing up another 20. And, and do you support that? Do you agree with that? Uh, y yeah, in in general terms, but it, it's going to be it's going to be very tricky. Uh, you know, to, to accomplish. Um, w w one thing that, uh, you know, that I should point out that, that's very interesting about, and this was another recommendation actually in the plan uh, concerning, you know, more efficient use and more sharing, is that, you know, those, those solid blue bands that you pointed to that represent, uh, you know, television broadcasting, you know, over here. Now, some of this has already been auctioned, but, but up here, um, it's actually not all allocated anymore to only broadcasting. So TV broadcasting, there are um, some, somewhat over 10,000 local channel slots for TV stations, but only about... 10,000? Yeah, a little over 10,000, and, and only about 17% you know, of those channel slots are actually used by full-power TV stations uh, today. And that was because, you know, particularly during the analog days, they had to space the, the, uh, the stations out to avoid interference. Right. And what the commission decided, the FCC decided a year ago, uh, 
was to allow all of the unassigned channel slots, so in other words, the, the actual the majority of, of, of channels in the TV band, to be used on an unlicensed basis for what we were calling uh, Wi-Fi on steroids. In other words, um, that, that where, a, where a channel uh, frequency was in the TV band was not being used by a licensed station, uh, such as David's example of you know, where channel 20 is in use here in Washington, that you could go on 21, for example, and use a very low power uh, device. Uh, but for the reasons he said, you know, the commission said, well, we've got to be very careful not to interfere with, with television reception. So we're requiring that these, uh, that these uh, unlicensed devices, these Wi-Fi type devices, operate at extremely low power levels and also check a database uh, to see what channels are available so that they don't um, interfere with, with viewing. David Donovan, the National Broadband Plan and Spectrum. Well, I think we sort of agree with Dr. Cooper, and that is, is it's not spectrum management doesn't dictate essentially taking spectrum away from an existing user that's that's serving hundreds of millions of viewers in the in the United States. Um, and if you begin to look at the broadband plan, um, I, I guess our perspective is this. We actually believe, as I've indicated, given the developments of over-the-air television at this point, in terms of mobile, in terms of additional video services and additional things, that we're part of the overall wireless architecture in this country. And indeed, as you go forward and you look at the demand, or at least that has been avowed the demand, the vast majority of that is to see video pictures, which, of course, our architecture has already been built and is indeed providing. So we think we're part of this plan. I mean, we support, for example, um, Congressman Boucher's Spectrum Inventory Bill because we have some concerns. And the concerns are, if you look very deeply at the broadband plan, it doesn't really go into a hard, strict inventory of how all this spectrum is being used. There are assumptions made. There are studies that have put in, in particular one by the International Telecommunications Union, which vastly overprojects what might be the demand going into the future. Moreover, it doesn't consider a, a number of factors, particularly with respect to meeting that demand through a system that we have already. I think one of the things that bothers us and I, is that there is a statement in the broadband plan that they want to take essentially 120 megahertz of spectrum. That's essentially 40 percent of the channels that are now allocated to television broadcasting they want to take. So think of it this way. You have a can of tennis balls and I decided to reduce that can by 40 percent. Can I put three tennis balls in that can? And the answer is no. They will not fit. So you have to make some decisions. And the decisions are either you get rid of some of the tennis balls or you shrink them all down. And if you look at their proposal at this point in time, which is essentially is to take every television station from channel 31 to 51 and say within three or five years you have to leave, you're talking over 670 television stations in this country. Um, if you look at New York, it's 11 stations. If you look at Los Angeles, it's 16 stations. In addition, you have literally thousands of translators, low-power TV, and Class A stations, the small broadcasters that are often forgotten in this, that frankly will have no home. Once you take those channels away, where do you put them? I have to, in essence, take all those stations and try to squeeze them into a much smaller band. We're out People lose service. We're out of time, but two final questions. We'll start with you, Mr. Sure. Donovan. Reed Hunt, the former FCC chair, recently said in a speech that uh, he thinks broadband is the new national medium. Do you agree with that? I think I disagree. And I think the reason is, is because for the last 50 years, and certainly going into the future, a point-to-multipoint -point distribution service which is what broadcasting is licensed on a local level, has provided basic news and information. The economics of news generation in this country, particularly with respect to reporters on the street, are all premised. And if you look at the economics, it's all local television that is driving that. And I think it would be a tragedy if we shifted to a model that, according to the Pew Research, right now news on the Internet is not economically sustainable by itself. Mr. Calabrese. So 
so I agree with the former FCC chairman, you know, in general, um, I, I think there's, there's clearly a, a convergence, an ongoing convergence uh, toward the internet, particularly as, as people get, uh, you know, super fast fiber to the homes. What's important about broadcasting, I think really ultimately is the content, including localism, local content, and not so much the transmission mechanism. People increasingly want uh, TV program, programming on their time and, and not, you know, at, at some single time. And we're right. going to have to leave it there. Right. Sorry, we are out of time. Michael Calabrese, David Donovan, both on the Commerce Spectrum Advisory Committee for the Commerce Department. Thank you for being on the communicators. cspan.org slash the communicators slash communicators is our website. You can find this, this uh, bookshelf or this quilt of uh, spectrum if you'd like to look at that um, for yourself. You can find it hyperlinked at that site. Thanks for being with us.